Listen, we've been talking about Gethsemane for uh, almost two months now. It has been just life-changing. If you haven't been here, you can pick up those uh, CDs, especially uh, the, the little two-parter, um, Gethsemane, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Part 1 and Part 2. Oh, that talks about how the Lord, uh, as he went to Gethsemane, Remember, it was on the week of his passion that he went into Jerusalem and everyone's crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he's riding that donkey and they're throwing their coats down and waving palm branches. Somebody give me some palm branch action here right now. Yeah, wave unto the Lord. Amen. And it's ironic because just a few days later, they weren't crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, God save us, but crucify him, crucify him. Boy, people are fickle, aren't they? Ah, there's a lot of people that change their mind a lot about Jesus. You know, but when you know him, I'm telling you, you'll never change your mind again. It'll just be the Lord. Taste of the Lord and see that he is good. Amen. How many here have tasted of the Lord? He's good, isn't he? And he's good all the time. It was during that time in the upper room he was enjoying the Passover meal with his disciples. Judas had already bargained with the Sanhedrin for 30 pieces of silver to betray the Lord, to turn Jesus into their hands. And here now he comes and joins them there at the Passover meal. Many know it as the Last Supper. And here Jesus is eating with the 12, including Judas, who the Bible says that Satan had provoked his heart, had tempted his heart. And now they're sitting there having that meal together. After the meal, the Gospel of John tells us that Jesus washed their feet. There in the upper room, Jesus washes the feet of all 12 disciples. Would that include Judas? Yes, it would. I don't want any reverb on my mic, please. So we see something here. Judas had already bargained to betray Jesus, but yet he comes to this meal. He sits there, and Jesus washes his feet. Now, Jesus already knew. The Bible tells us. He already knew when he chose Judas as a disciple that he would betray him. Already knew it. But it was according to scripture, according to prophecy, according to God's plan. So here, Judas is having his feet washed by the Lord. Can you imagine what might be going through his mind? Oh, my goodness. And Jesus looks up at Judas, and all he can see is darkness in his eyes. After washing the feet of his disciples, Judas leaves. And then Jesus stands up. And he takes the bread and he takes the cup. This is my body given for you. Take it and eat and do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood shed, a new covenant shed for the remission of sins. Take it and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. And now we do that even today, don't we? It's a continuing ordinance in the church that we do, that Jesus started there 2,000 years ago in the upper room. After that, they leave singing a hymn, 11 disciples and Jesus. They go to a place called Gethsemane. It's found at the base of the Mount of Olives. It wasn't more than 500 yards away from where they were. As they walked there, they sang, Jesus knowing what was going to happen. He goes there to pray. When he arrives in Gethsemane, which li literally means oil press, this garden of olive trees he tells his disciples to wait and he takes three with him a little further Peter, James and John he says watch and pray with me for my soul is overwhelmed they've never seen Jesus like this before he begins to sweat he, he begins to be anxious he, something is going on within the Lord so they stay there and Jesus goes on a little further and he falls on his face and he prays 
Now, I was asked, why didn't Jesus stay with his disciples and just have a, a prayer meeting? Because sometimes you just don't want nobody around. Sometimes you just want to get alone with God. And he finds his disciples sleeping three times, and he gently rebukes them. Was it their intention to fall asleep? Absolutely not. That's why Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your spirit wants to, but your flesh fights it. And how many of us know we give in to our flesh way more than we should? But our spirit is willing. Good intentions. Hell is paved with those. Then Jesus, the third time he goes over, sees Judas coming. He says, behold, my betrayer comes. His disciples stand up with him. And in Mark 14, we pick up the story. In Mark 14, we pick up the story. And I would love to recap what I taught about Judas last week. Get the tape. It's Gethsemane, the betrayal, part one. I brought in Judas, his background, where he came from, what his name means, uh, the makeup of the man. It's all in the Bible. The Bible talks about Judas 30 times in the gospel, twice in, in, in the book of Acts. And he is a major player in, our, in this redemption. <laughs> he betrayed the Lord. Now, I don't even like talking about it. That's why you don't hear a lot about it from pulpits. But it's part of the Gethsemane scene. It's part of the, uh, the account of the Gethsemane story. It needs to be told. Amen. So we pick it up here. You know, it just boggles my mind I, I, that Judas, handpicked by Judas Iscariot now, because there was another Judas, but this is Judas the betrayer, Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. It boggles my mind that this man walked with Jesus, heard the voice of God every day, heard the sermons, saw Jesus walk on water, cast out devils, turn water into wine, heal the crippled, deaf ears heard. I mean, he saw it all. And then he was part of the 12, remember, ordained by Jesus to go out and preach the gospel. He said, I give you 12 authority and power to cast out devils, preach the gospel, anoint the sick, and they will recover. That would include Judas. And he came back, part of the 12, saying, even the demons submit to us in your name. But yet there was something inside Judas that gnawed at him. He had a problem with money. I've heard it all. I've researched it. I've heard it all. Judas wasn't such a bad guy. He, he just wanted Jesus to, to get him to the place where he would call down fire on the Romans or he would lead a revolt against the Roman tyranny. Not at all. Greed motivated Judas. Simple Greed, the love of money. The Bible says, and we won't go there in 1 Timothy, last week I said, that greed, because of greed, many err, many fall away from the faith. Because of the love of many, many are pierced with many sorrows. Let me know money can be a headache. <laughs> You're worried about somebody going to take it from you. Now, it's the only place I know of where you pay money in order to keep your money. I, it's, now, money isn't wrong. How many here like money? I do. I, I need it to pay the bills and put gas in my car and all that. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. We're to love not the things in the world, sir. We're to love God and love people. That's it. We're to love what? Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. 
When you stop seeking after the almighty dollar and start seeking after the almighty God who has all the dollars, <laughs> who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, all the gold and silver is his. He said he'll take care of your every need. Your every single need will be provided for. He says, my children are wealthy kids. But it's the love of money that drove him. Did you know Judas was the, uh, he carried the bag. He was the ministry uh, treasurer, director of finances, if you will. He's the one that held the money. Jesus would often say, take some money and go feed the poor, take some money. So we see that during the course of his ministry, many people gave to his ministry. Otherwise, why would you need a guy with a money bag to watch over the money? That money became a foothold for Satan to work in Judas's life, as money will in ours as well. That's why the Bible says, bring the whole tithe. Bring your offering to the storehouse. Why? So money can't get a hold on you. It's God's word. What's more? No one can serve two masters. No one can serve God and money. Let's serve God, who provides all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So Judas, Judas had a greed problem that caused him to go to the priest and negotiate. It says he negotiated for 30 pieces of silver. It probably started out, Judas saying, I want 100 pieces of silver for Jesus. I'll turn them to you. No way. I'll give you, four. I'll give you 50. I want 40. I'll give you 30. Yeah, deal. Can you see that happening? Because the word says he negotiated Amen. Now, let's pick it up here with Judas coming in with this mob, this band of men to arrest Jesus, to turn Jesus over to the, uh, these angry men. Uh, Mark 14, we're going to look at verse 41 through 46. Go ahead. And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. 42. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And 44. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. And 45. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. Wow. There's the scene. Judas comes with this large mob, many people tell me, but it wasn't a mob. It was an organized little army made up of Roman soldiers and temple police carrying swords and staves or clubs. The swords, see the temple police, the guards that guarded the temple, they were not allowed to have deadly weapons. So they used billy clubs, clubs, to control the crowd. The Romans, on the other hand, they used lethal force. They carried swords. The Bible also says in another gospel that officers came, which alludes as well to the Romans uh, coming to arrest Jesus. Judas had gone to the priest and said, look, I need temple police to come with me. Then they go to Pilate and say, we need a contingency, a small contingency. A contingency of Roman soldiers is about seven or 800 men. And they, they, they speculate the temple guard had been about 200. So anywhere from 800 to 1,000 Armed men, some with clubs, some with swords, came to arrest one man. Kind of brave, huh? A thousand men that night came, along with chief priests and Pharisees, to arrest Jesus in the middle of the night, which was illegal according to their own law. Oh, man. To elaborate or to give us a fuller picture, we must go to the book of John. 
we must go to the book of John. gives us a little better of a picture on what's happening here than the book of Mark. So let's go to John 18, verses 2 through 6. John 18, verses 2 through 6, please. Go ahead. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with the disciples. See, Judas knew where he was going to be at. This is further proof that Gethsemane was a favorite place of Jesus to retreat to. What does it say? Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, Gethsemane, for Jesus oft times resorted there with his disciples. It was a place where Jesus went to rest, to teach his disciples, and to pray. Go ahead. Verse 3. Judas, then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests mm -hmm. and Pharisees. A band of men, including officers, which speaks of the Roman guard. Uh, also temple police or temple guards. Priests and Pharisees, they come with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Why did they have lanterns and torches? Well, it was dark. It was pitch black over there at the... <laughs> Garden of Gethsemane. They needed to light the way, but also identify Jesus. Verse number four. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Yeah, who, who are you looking for? He knew who, who they were looking for. Look at five. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Now, As in, the original, in the original Greek, the he is not there. That's why it's in those brackets. Jesus said, I am. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And verse number 6. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Now, get the picture here. It's the only play of the, all the Gospels. John is the only one that includes this little happening, if you will. I think it's major. A thousand men, Roman, Roman, Romans with swords and temple police with clubs, and, and they've been trained to use them. And, and then the Pharisees, the religious men come. And Jesus says, I am, and they fall down. Now, why do they fall down? Now, I went to school for this. Hold on. I'm going to give you the big thing. They fell down because they can't stand up. Make sense? They fell down because they couldn't stand up. Something happened to them. Something knocked them down. What was it? The glory of the Messiah. When Jesus said, I am, which is a name of God, and it talks about the very existence of God. I am means I exist because I exist. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I exist because I am. Jesus revealed a little of his Shekinah glory at that time. A little bit of who he is. The I am. The Christ. The son of the living God. And all thousand fell down like dominoes on the ground as if they were dead. How many know that's power? How many know that's glory? How many know that's God? I've had people ask me in church, why do people fall down? I see it. Don't be afraid. Well, it makes me afraid. Well, have you seen everything God can do? Have you seen everything God can do? Then why are you judging? This is just another thing he can do. And why do they fall down? Because they can't stand up. Turn to somebody and say they can't stand up. Doesn't, doesn't that make sense? They're overwhelmed by God's glory, his presence, his power. And then Jesus, and then Jesus turns it off. They fell to the ground. Now, verse 7, <laughs> they're laying on the ground. You would think that would be a clue. Do you know you, another reason why that happened? They came to arrest Jesus. They came to lay hands on him. I think Jesus said, oh, you're going to touch me? I am. And they all fell down. I think Jesus was flexing muscle just a little bit. You know? He was kind of flexing who he was. Well, you're going to take me, huh? Oh, really? I am. Boom. That's why Jesus said, no one takes my life. I lay it down, and I have power to take it up. 
He yielded his, he yielded, nobody's going to arrest Jesus and lay hands on him unless he wants them to, according to God's plan. Don't omit this from your thinking about what happened in the garden. It happened. They fell down. And verse 7. Then asked he them again, whom seek ye? <laughs> They're all laying on the ground, probably shaking their heads, you know. Blah, 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 blah. What happened? Groggy. And then Jesus said, now who it is you? Who, now who are you looking for? <laughs> uh, uh, we're looking for Jesus. <laughs> he said, I am. And they took hold of him. The first time was to show them, you're not taking me unless I want you to. The second time, he yielded himself and allowed him. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Now, an interesting uh, thing here is that Judas had made a signal. What was the signal? A kiss, right? And the Bible says he came straight away. Remember? In Mark it says straight away. He made a beeline to Jesus and kissed him. Now that word kissed in the Bible, it's an interesting word. You should look it up. It's a continuous verb as if he kissed him and kissed him and kissed him and kissed him. Over and over again. And it was at this time that the devil had already entered Judas it was as if Satan was making a statement in your face, Jesus. He had already said, I am. They knew who he was. Why did Judas have to go ahead and kiss him? That was the signal of who he was. No, there was intent, devious, wicked intent here. Now, a kiss in the Bible, the Bible even says, greet one another with a holy kiss, right? Right? You know what that means? It means with love and affection. Now, I don't want all you guys going around kissing each other. All right? But what is the intent of that? Greet each other with holy kiss. It means love, affection, honor. I, I, I remember the prodigal uh, son when he came back. His father hugged him. And you probably did this with your kids. How many have done it? You hug them when you were afraid and they're safe and you begin to kiss them. Have you ever done it? Seriously. Well, that's the intent here, but in a wicked, devious, perverted way with Judas as he continued to kiss him and kiss him. And Jesus said, you betray the son of a man, you betray the son of man with a kiss? With a phony act of love? And the Bible says they took him. Now, isn't this interesting? Is it? I mean, there's so much more when we talk about the garden scene than we usually do. We just glance over it and we get to the cross. So much happened here. Judas makes a beeline to Jesus, kisses him, supposedly identifying him as the Lord. Now, now watch this. Back to Mark 14. Back to Mark 14, verse 46 again, all the way through 53 now. Go ahead. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now, who might that be? Who do you think that was? Peter. You think that was Peter? Well, the Bible says it was Peter in John 18, 10. But keep reading. Go ahead. And Jesus answered and said unto them, are you come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. He says, look, I've been with you in the, in the temple. I walked down your streets, and yet you never laid your hands on me. But yet you do it under the cover of darkness. You do it hiding. You do it like cowards. But yet the scriptures must be fulfilled. Next verse. And they all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now stop. Now I got your, now I got your attention. See? Now it's a little risque now. And all of a sudden everybody perks up. Check it out. 
Go back to 51. And there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young man, the, the young men laid hold on him. The, the soldiers, the temple guards grabbed him. They were trying to grab everybody. At this time, after, they, after, after Judas kissed the Lord, they laid hands on him to arrest him. And his disciples, his 11 disciples, took off. Boom. They gone. They fled. As Scripture says that he was left alone, deserted. Now, here it says there is another character here. Many people, it was John. That's what I've heard of the most is John. No, it wasn't. Do you really think one of the disciples went to the Passover meal naked, wrapped in a linen cloth? I don't think so. A linen cloth was used for what? Sleep. It was put on the bed. They put it over them when they slept. Evidently, and this makes perfectly good sense, when that thousand miniature army went to arrest Jesus with torches and lanterns, it made some commotion in town, don't you think? And it woke, in the middle of the night, it woke up this young man, and he goes, what in the world's going on out there? I see lights over there in Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. I'm going to go check it out. He takes the linen, the, uh, the sheet, the linen cloth, wraps it around him, and out he goes to find out what's going on. It's kind of like what you do. You wrap yourself in a blanket to go out and get the newspaper. How many have ever done that before? I mean, all right. And he goes out, and he sees it. He wants to find out what's going on. You'd probably do it. I know I would. And looking around, I might put on some sweats or something. But he wraps a sheet around him, and, and he's, he's looking around. When he got too close, and some of the guards and some of the men saw him and said, arrest him. And they went to grab him, grab a hold of the sheet. It, they, they pulled it. He came out of the sheet and ran naked down the... Well, that's what it says. And he took his flight naked into the, into the darkness. What a movie on the women's channel that would make. <laughs> the women's movie channel. Wouldn't that be great? Anyway... What? You're enjoying this, and you know it, honey. Now, see, I just kissed her hand three times. See, I said, what do you do? But that was love and honor right there. Hallelujah. So this was probably someone not even named in the Bible that got up to see what was going on, and he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they tried to get him, and he took off running. Now, the Bible also says that Peter followed them to see where they were going to take the Lord. But did you know that Judas followed them too? Because the Bible says that when Judas found out that they condemned Jesus to death, he repented or he was sorrow-filled and tried to return the money. Do you remember that? He tried to return the money, and they said, we can't take that money. It's unlawful. Can you imagine these hypocrites? They break the law by arresting Jesus. Now they get all holier than thou. People are like that. They go home and do what they want in church. They're another person. Can't we just get right with God? Can't we just get real with God? Can't we say, I got quirks. I got problems. Get it out of me. I want to be right with you, God. My spirit is willing, and I'm trying to keep my flesh down. Can we be real? He knows your every heartbeat. He knows your every thought. He knows your every word before you speak it. He knows the desires of your heart. You can't hide from God. How I many of you can't hide from God? Stop running. There might be somebody here. You're running from God. You can't run from God. Wherever you go, he's there. Hallelujah. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. God's presence, His mercy, His grace is following you even when you're on the run. And when you finally decide to stop and turn around, it's there to embrace you, to forgive you, and to take you in. Come on, somebody. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So he takes the money. After he, he follows, he looks, he sees, and he sees that Jesus is condemned. He becomes full of sorrow. Now, let me tell you something about sorrow. The Bible talks about two kinds of sorrow. 
worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Judas experienced worldly sorrow. He felt bad about the whole situation. You know what was a clue when I read it and I didn't say anything? Remember when Jesus came, he said, look, the one I kiss is going to be Jesus. You apprehend him, but take him away safely. They didn't. They beat him to a pulp right there in the garden. And they took him away. And Judas followed. And when he found out he was con Jesus was condemned, he took the money back. I don't want the money. We can't take it. It's blood money. He took it. He threw it at him. It says it in the Bible. And he ran off and hung himself. That's not true repentance. Repent and hang yourself. No, repent and be saved, every one of you. He was experiencing worldly sorrow. Let me tell you something about worldly sorrow. When people get caught for stealing or doing something wrong, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're sorry because you got caught, not because it was wrong. See the difference? Oh, I'm sorry I did it. I'm sorry I did it. Yeah, you're sorry you did it because you got caught. Not because it's wrong. But godly sorrow says it's wrong. Whether I get caught or not, it's wrong. It's wrong. It's a sin against God. And God, godly sorrow comes before true repentance. This is how I was taught. Godly sorrow is the porch. Repentance is the door. You got to get on the porch before you can get in the door. Godly sorrow gets you on the porch that you can repent, truly repent, get you in the door to the house of salvation. Wow. And the Bible says he hung himself. And those priests took that money. What are we going to do with this money? Let's take a, let's have a committee. <laughs> That'll take a year or two to figure that out. Let's have a committee. Let's, let's. And they decided to buy the potter's field. Do you know what the potter's field was? They have them even today. Taken their reference from the Bible. A potter's field is a place even today where the poor are buried or foreigners are buried, strangers are are buried with no name. It's called a potter's field even today. They're around. Back then, a potter's field was this. It was literally a field, a dumping place for the potters to dump their pottery pieces, broken, rejected pieces. It was a dump of pottery, jagged edges and, and piece, sharp pieces. And the Pharisees said, for 30 pieces of silver, we can buy this field and bury Judas in it. So they bought the field. And to this day, it's called the potter's field, the field of blood. The Bible also says in the book of Acts, let's look, Acts 1. Let's look. Oh, I missed that little part right there. That was a good one. All right. I might. Acts 1, verse 18. Oh, that was a goodie. All right. Acts 1, 18 says, Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and fall, falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. He couldn't even hang himself right. He hangs himself from a tree. Evidently, that was over this potter's field, and the, and the branch broke, and he fell to his death on those broken pieces of pottery that just ripped his body to pieces. What does it say there? Headlong, he burst asunder in the mist, and all his bowels gushed out. What a movie this would make. Huh? I mean... <laughs> He couldn't even do that right. And they found his body in the morning. They bought the potter's field. They buried him there. 
the little part that I left out that I want to I tell you about is, I think, very important. May I go back? I never do this. I never miss. But I'm so excited about the wet slide out there. That, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm first. Let's look at this. Now, before I leave the potter's field, I want to explain one little thing to you because evidently there's such a big contradiction in the Bible, according to some people, which doesn't amount to a hill of beans. It's not true at all. They call it the Matthew 27, verse 5, versus the Acts 118 conflict. In Matthew 27, it says that the priest bought the field. Let us buy the potter's field. Says we can't keep this money. And they said, yes, they bought the field. They buried Judas there. All right. In 118, it says that he bought it. Now, this man purchased the field, this man being Judas. He was dead. He didn't purchase the field. This is what happened. If I gave you $100 and said, go buy that car for me, whose car is it? Thank you. But who bought it? Yeah. She just solved the problem. Boy, you're good. It was bought in Judas' name. So it is his field. The Pharisees bought it in his name. Took them because they, they couldn't touch it. They couldn't put it in their name. So he took the money and said, we want to buy this field in the name of Judas Iscariot. Here's the money. He's dead. We're going to bury him there. But it's in his name. So there's no contradiction. I don't know what's up with that. Isn't that crazy? People... People want to find so much fault with something, they'll grab anything. There's no fault in the Bible. No contradiction in the Bible. It's reliable from Genesis to Revelation. You can stand on it. You can sleep with it. You can eat it. You can drink it. Believe it. Trust it. And it works. Thank you. Hallelujah. Now, may I go back? May I revisit a little portion of my message, and then we're going to quit? I said, may I revisit a little portion? Thank you. Matthew 26, 51 through 54. Matthew 26, 51 through 54. I might visit two places, all right? <laughs> See, when I put things on these little posty notes, they get lost. See? But the little posty note things are the, really, are the really great God things because after I'm all done, oh, my goodness, you know, the Holy Ghost gives you something, you write it on a posty note. <clears throat> Go ahead. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priests and smote off his ear. Now we heard that before. What's the big deal, Pastor? All right, keep going. Then sent Jesus unto him, put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take up the sword shall perish with the sword. And 53. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve th legions of angels. What well, stop Many think that Jesus said this from the cross. He didn't say it from the cross. He said it in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, look, he, Peter takes his little dagger. It says a sword, but it was a dagger. And it was used to slit the throat of your enemy. So Peter, go, he can't even do that right. He goes and tries to slit this servant's throat. He dodges it, and he cuts his ear off. A and Jesus said, look, Stop. He who lives by the sword, die by the sword. He says, don't you think I couldn't pray to my father and he'll send me 72,000 angels? Not only would his glo revealed glory kill him, fry him, but angels would have came. You know, the Bible says one angel took out a quarter of a million Assyrians. One angel wiped out a quarter of a million of an enemy coming against Israel. What do you think 72,000 angels could do? They could have used a little midget mop on the floor in heaven to come over here and take care of this little thing. Amen. And look what Jesus said. He didn't say, I could command those angels. He said, I could ask my father. I could pray. And my father would send those angels. And I bet those angels were in heaven going, let us go, Father. They're going to take Jesus. Let us go. We'll 
fry them. We'll toast them. We'll evaporate them. Let us go. And the father said, no. Boy, the tears fell in heaven, huh? As they arrested the Lord and beat him. According to plan. Now, when you pray, angels are released. The Bible says in Psalm 103, according to the voice of the word, according to the voice of God's word, angels respond. Who gives voice to God's word on earth? Every time you quote a scripture, angels react. Every time you speak the name of Jesus, angels respond. Every time you speak, thus saith the Lord, angels fight for you. Keep quoting the word. Keep speaking, thus saith the Lord. Lord, help me. Lord, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And angels are coming to your rescue, are protecting you, shielding you. They're like little ninjas. Yeah. Everybody was kung fu fighting. No, they're not like ninjas. I'm just, just having fun. Can I backtrack to one other place? Luke 22. Luke 22, 47 through 51. And then really, we're done. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Are you enjoying this? Luke 22, 47 through 51. Please go ahead. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude. And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before this them. This is what we were reading. Go ahead. And drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw, that, saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right that ear. That was Peter, remember? Go ahead. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. Check it out. And he touched his ear and healed him. The only place it's found is right there in Luke 22:51. You didn't know that, did you? Some of you knew he cut off an ear, but he picked it up. Well, wait a minute. You know, he did a creative miracle. It says he just healed him. He didn't pick anything up. He just went like that, and there's an ear. Anyway, whatever he did, he was healed. You think that would change their minds? First of all, everyone gets knocked down. That's enough for me to go home. Then they see an ear cut off, laying, flopping around on the ground. Can you hear me now? <laughs> we better go eat. Can you hear me now? I'm going to get letters. And healed him. You think that might joggle anybody? No, they were so darkened, so dead set. Nothing could happen. Even today, people are like that. Oh, I had somebody just, yes, if they, Pastor, if they could just find, you know, the Noah's Ark, that's on the mountain, something, Turkey, and if they could just find that, oh, people would get saved. No, they won't. When the rich man was in hell, and he said, let me go back and tell my brothers so they don't come here. He said, no, even if you went back and they saw you back from the dead, they wouldn't believe. They have the prophets. They have the word. That's enough. Remember this. A miracle can't save anybody. It just gets their attention. It provokes them one of two ways. It Hardens them and chases them away or softens them and brings them close when they see a miracle. It cannot save them. What saves them is the word of God. The Bible says God's word, the gospel, converts the soul. Hallelujah. And he heals that man. And they still lay hands on him and beat him and take him away to fulfill God's plan. Well, we're done with Gethsemane. 
what a ride this has been. I probably enjoyed this series more than any other one I preached because it was such new ground for me. I mean, I was eating it up. You know, I was staying up to 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, studying and reading and seeing what God has and getting excited. Man, that kind of renewed my inner being. Because when you're in that new ground, you're going, whoa, I didn't know that. Whoa, look at that. Whoa, Jesus. Whoa, whoa, wow. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God's plan. Amen. Stand on your feet, please. Come on, bow your heads. Maybe there's somebody here. You don't want to end up in a potter's field. Did you hear what I said? You don't want to end up on broken pottery. You don't want to end up on potter's field. You want to end up in the fields of heaven. Hallelujah. Bow your heads, please. Is there somebody here this morning that would say, Pastor, I want this living God. I want to ask Christ to be my king. I want to be saved. I want to know that I know that I know that my name is in that Lamb's book of life. I want to open my heart to Jesus. Now, come on. You tried it your way long enough. Why don't you try the name of Jesus? Hey, you've tried the name of Jack Daniels. You tried the name of crack. You tried the name of perversion. Let's try the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's try the name of Jesus. He will not let you down. He will help you, strengthen you, save you, change you. Who needs a change of life? Raise your hand right now. Quick, quick. Look at the hands. Who needs an honest to goodness change of life? Look at the hands. Yes, 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 yes. Well, it's time. Today is a day of salvation. Today, heaven is open. Today he says, come, come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you salvation. Those of you that raised your hands, and even if you didn't, if you mean it with God right now, if you want to get right with Jesus right now, I'm telling you, the days are shortening. Time is coming when our Lord will return. Let's be one of the number that will go to him up in the air in the rapture and be with the Lord forever. Come on, let's pray out loud together. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Cleanse me. Change me. I want a new life in you. I confess with my mouth. Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in my heart. God raised him from the dead. Now I know, according to the word and your Holy Spirit within me, I am saved, born again brand new, changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody clap real loud right now. I said somebody clap real loud right now. I want, I want you guys to make some noise, some happy noise. Come on. Somebody shout Jesus. Come on. Turn it up, Holly. Praise God. Everything is ready for you outside. May God bless you. May he prosper you in Jesus' name. Go in peace right outside the door. It's all ready for you. Love you. God bless you. I